Hello and welcome to this edition of Video Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, the Masters Series. I'm Brian Duncan, a surgeon in Houston, Texas, and I have with me today Dr. Jeffrey Ponsky, who is a professor of surgery at the uh, Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine and just happens to be one of my mentors. I had the opportunity to do my fellowship with Dr. Ponsky back in the day. In fact, I think I was your first one-year fellow. It was a six-month fellowship up till then. Must have been a slow learner. <laughs> Um, and uh, we're going to spend some time together learning about uh, Dr. Ponsky's um, path in, uh, in endoscopy. Uh, so welcome. Welcome Thanks, to the Brian. edition. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's nice to have you here. I thought we would just kick things off easy and start a little bit with your background. Just, you know, kind of uh, born and raised, a little bit about your family, kind of maybe even take us up through your schooling until uh, through medical school kind of thing. Well, briefly, I was born in Cleveland and really never left. Uh, in high school, I was uh, somewhat almost a delinquent. I was told not to go to college by my unit principal because I was always in trouble. So he says, save your parents some money. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, I Class clown? Uh, Why were you in trouble? Well, I was uh, uh, doing a lot of things, cutting school and going out with girls to the beach and shouldn't have been doing things like that. Ah. But... Uh, Went to Miami of Ohio in Oxford, Ohio, and really decided I was going to <clears throat> be a doctor no matter what it took. I suddenly was inspired. I had a role model. My mother's brother was an, an internist in Cleveland who I thought was a god, mm -hmm. and he was a wonderful role model. I wanted to be just like him. And so I studied very hard at Miami and really did well. I was very fortunate that that was a great school and uh, encouraged me, and I went to Case Western Reserve School of Medicine, and I did very well there. I mean, it was, I was very paranoid that I wouldn't do well, so I worked very hard and uh, was able to do well. I was an AOA, and, and uh, I got some honors there. And then I did my residency in surgery at Case Western Reserve University, mm -hmm. and uh, that's the story. And why surgery? You had a mentor that was so an internist. That's a, yeah, a very good question. During my uh, college years, I had no money. We've had very little money growing up, and I worked every summer. And uh, my uncle, who was the internist, uh, got me a position at a Mount Sinai hospital in Cleveland to be an orderly mm -hmm. during the summer. After the first year, I became an assistant in surgery, a second assistant, and a scrub nurse. I was a terrible scrub nurse, but I was a pretty <laughs> good assistant, and they let me sew closed bellies and do things like that when the head nurse wasn't looking. And so I was very technically able by the time I was in medical school and found that during my clerkships I was a, a star at doing the technical aspects and wanted to be a surgeon to emulate the people I'd worked with then. Yeah. I think I still do my drapes on the field the way you taught me in fellowship because <laughs> that came from your first assistant. That's days. right, yeah. exactly. So you, so you go and you do your surgery residency training at Case and um, my guess is that endoscopy was not part of the typical surgery training at that time. So tell me the story about how you got exposed to and then interested in endoscopy. Well, it was 1973. <coughs> I was uh, a third year PG-3 uh, in, in surgery, just finishing it. And during that time, uh, you were allowed to have some elective. Mm -hmm. And elective time was even more flexible then. Uh, we were on call every other night. It was a brutal residency uh, in surgery at that time. And I looked around for something to do to sort of take the steam away and to relax a little bit. And I happened to be walking through the ICU and I saw the gastroenterologist trying to do endoscopy. It was sort of new in those days. They were using an old ACMI scope that had a joystick like this. And I said, you know, I might just try to do that during my elective for a couple of months. It'll be easy, no night call, easy. And so I called the Department of uh, Gastroenterology and talked to someone junior there, and they said, sure. A week before, bef uh, before this was supposed to start, and this was supposed to start in January of 1974, um, exactly 45 years ago. <laughs> and I called up and the chief of gastroenterology answered the phone. This is a case Western Reserve. And he said, look, we're not going to train a surgeon to do endoscopy, period. End of conversation. So I went back and told my chief of surgery then, Charlie Hubay, 
<clears throat> and he said, Jeff, that's terrible. He said, I happen to know a gastroenterologist who's in private practice in Canton, Ohio, which was 60 miles from Cleveland. His name was Jim King, and he had a partner, Jerry Smith, who mm -hmm. trained with Worth Boys. And uh, they were very anxious. They were doing a huge volume of endoscopy at a place called Timken Mercy Hospital. It's now called Mercy Hospital. And he wanted to train somebody. He was so anxious to train someone and said, sure, come on. So every day for six months, I drove to Canton and came home from Canton in the evening. And I was exposed to not just endoscopy, but the latest in medicine. Jim was like electricity. We would talk about all sorts of medicine and the basics of gastrointestinal pathology and pathophysiology. It was an unbelievably electric experience. By the end of that time, I had done almost 500 endoscopies. I spent four months. And I'd done almost 500 endoscopies. So I came back to Case. It was now the new year. I was a PG-4 mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And I said to the chair of gastroenterology, I would, had this experience. I would love to help train your residents in endoscopy. I work here at the VA during my spare time. I would love to be involved. And he looked at me and he said, you will not touch a scope here. No surgeon's going to touch a scope here. So I went to my chairman, mm -hmm. who was named Bill Holden, wonderful man. And I told him the story. He said, Jeff, I sympathize with you. He said, but I don't have any money right now, June of 1974. He said, I don't have any money to buy you a scope. He says, if you wait a while, maybe, but I don't have money now. I understood. And so a little time went on. I was quite frustrated. Actually, as I rotated to the VA, I was able to use the surgical service, had a colonoscope, and I used it a little bit. But I wasn't doing much. And then I was at a holiday party, almost Christmas time, 1974. And I was telling this story to my brother-in-laws and my mother-in-law, just as we were sitting on the couches. Uh -huh. And my mother-in-law called me the next day. I was on call at the VA hospital. I was in the on-call room, and she said, Go buy yourself a Hanukkah present. Go buy that scope. I said, are you sure it's $5,200? She said, go buy the scope. I bought that scope immediately on the phone that night. You just call up the company and say, hey, uh, send I knew me that one of those? It was Arnie Hoffman, who was the, uh, the uh, Olympus rep at that time. Uh -huh. was, I went to high school with him, and uh, he sent it out right away. And I kept that scope in my car. Gastroscope. Gastroscope, mm -hmm. G-I-F-K had a 30 degree angle on the end of it. Ah. And I got the permission to do it on surgical patients. And the G Dr. Robert Zollinger Jr. was my attending. He said, I'll come in with you for every case and sign the papers. And maybe you could teach me a little bit while you're doing it. And we would take every case. And then all of a sudden, the internists started calling. And the pediatric surgeons started to call me. Bob Izant, the chief of pediatric surgery, he sent me all the endoscopy. By the end of two years, I had finished my training, and I had literally taken over GI endoscopy for emergencies at the hospital. The private internists were calling me to come in for bleeders, because I would come right away. Mm -hmm. And they hired me on as the uh, head of surgical endoscopy, unheard of position at that time. In 1976, a case. A case. Ah. And I joined the faculty there as assistant professor. Now, well, let me get this straight. So, you're a fourth year surgery resident, uh, fourth slash fifth during this experience. You've got a scope in the trunk of your car. <laughs> and if there's an emergency case to be done, endoscopy, you're getting paged, and you run out to the car, get the scope, do the procedure disinfect it afterwards and put it back in the truck. So when I was working at the university hospital, I left it hanging in, in, the, a, in, in the unit. A, in the unit. Okay. There was no unit. In the, the littlest, smallest OR they could find that uh -huh. nobody else used, it was for sigmoidoscopy, that was my endoscopy room. Ah, uh, okay. And you gave your own sedation. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you about when we started ERCP and how that was. But yeah. we would do all of this, and I had the scope hanging there, and... There was no disinfection. It was green soap. 
We washed the scope with, we didn't wear gloves. Yeah. Even for colonoscopy. I hate to tell you, we didn't. <laughs> and we used to wash the scope with green scope and hang it up, green soap and hang it up again. Yeah. And uh, there were no washing machines or sterile, uh, high level disinfection then. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if it made much of a difference either, but we did it. Yeah. And I used that scope. And then in 1975, a year later, mm -hmm. in the end of the year, Dr. Holden, the chairman, called me in his office and said, I just got you a $5,000 Cancer Society grant that I can pay you back with for buying your scope. I said, thank you, Dr. Holden. I didn't call my mother-in-law. I called Olympus and said, send, send me a Duodena scope. <laughs> True. So that paid yeah. for my second scope, which was a Duodena scope. This hospital had a colonoscope at the VA, which I used, uh -huh. but I needed a duodena scope because ERCP was just starting for me then. So in residency, you got it. Uh, you started uh, with a duodena scope as well, right? Yes, this my is own duodena scope. Yeah. yeah, my own duodena scope. And were you doing ERCP? At so that I point? started doing ERCP. I was learning at the same time as the GI people were learning, uh -huh. and the person there was a wonderful fellow who was from Australia, and we learned together. We would talk about our tips. There were no wire-guided catheters. There were no papillotomes. We literally had to bend and, and do tricks to get the cannula. We were learning. Yeah. Now understand, in Japan and Germany, they were doing sphincterotomy already, but we hadn't done it then. Ironically, I quickly picked up ERCP, but I needed to learn sphincterotomy, and I made a deal with a gastroenterologist in Pittsburgh named George Broadmerkel. Mm -hmm. He was a pioneer in ERCP in this country. And George called me over. He said, Jeff, if you teach me laparoscopy, I will teach you sphincterotomy. He made his own sphincterotomes, and we did that. Yeah. We made that deal. In those days, we did laparoscopy with room air under local anesthesia. Yeah. And for pump, liver diagnosis. Pump it, pump it, it air, like yeah. For, like the Flex Sigs we used That's to do. That's what the rigid we did, scope. yes, yeah. and we mm -hmm. did that. Ironically, I talked to George Bursey on which scope to buy for that, everything. I had my own scope for that. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Had my whole collection of my own scopes. Yeah. So that's what happened with endoscopy. And at university hospitals, I was doing all the endoscopy. In fact, I started doing all the pediatric endoscopy. There was no such thing as a pediatric endoscopy, a GI person in Cleveland at that time. Yeah. And so I was doing all of it, which led to... Yeah. The peg. Yeah. Now, b before we get to the peg, because yeah, sure. obviously I want to talk about that. I just want to, you know, today still, surgeons coming out of training into practice have to navigate sometimes the um, pathway to doing endoscopy in their practice. And so we just heard about you navigating it really through your training. Now you're an assistant professor. They actually give you an appointment specifically to do endoscopy, if I'm understanding that right. Talk to me about those early days. Was it just kind of a continuation because you had laid the groundwork? Or? Well, it was a continuation, but I still wasn't allowed to use their unit. Really? So we... You're working in that same room. That same, same little room. Uh -huh. But ironically, there was one little nurse who they gave to me every time. She had glasses as thick as Coke bottles, okay? Mm -hmm. And she... I would come in once in a while, and the table would be so beautifully set up Everything taken apart and ready for to go, the lubricant, the biopsy forceps, everything was there. I said, who is this person? They said, oh, should we let her work with you because she can't see the scrub well. I said, I want her for my nurse. She gained the, one of the big shots in SG&A. Really? She was writing articles about PEG and how to do it. She was with me through Jill Kuntz through the whole thing. Amazing. Amazing. So she was a star. <laughs> Um, so let's get to, to PEG, because obviously a lot of people know you uh, from that um, invention. Tell me, tell me how that came to be. So I was doing a lot of pediatric endoscopy. You don't think you have to, but all of a sudden they have babies with GI bleeds, and uh, you don't know why, and there's reasons for it. But I would scope these babies using a big scope, by the way. There was no pediatric scope then. And... The pediatric surgeon who joined the staff in about 1976 at uh, uh, university would often be there, Michael Gowderer, brilliant guy, brilliant innovator. And Michael had long been thinking, is there a way to do a minimally invasive gastrostomy? He was very innovative. Mm -hmm. We got together one day in the hall, 
and say, you know, we're doing these babies, often they're brain dead, the cerebral asphyxia, severe psychomotor retardation. We're doing laparotomies because the nursing homes want them to have a, pa a gastrostomy for feeding. Yeah. What if we could just do something? And so we worked it out, how to put a needle, and we did the first five babies there at Rainbow in the operating room in 1979, like May of 1979. Then I went to Mount Sinai Hospital because I joined the faculty there. I was age 32 to become the chairman of surgery there. Another story. I mean, I yeah. was way too young to be a chairman, but they said, if you don't like it, come back. So I, I went there, and I did the first adults at Mount Sinai. And uh, I think Mike came over, and we did the first adults over there. And I presented Peg a year later in, uh, at the in 1980 at the ASGE meeting in Salt Lake City. And there were thousands of people at the plenary session. It was a big, long room, and I remember presenting it with a video that we had. The video was with a big 16-millimeter camera on my shoulder. <laughs> and at the end, people got up to make comments. And mm -hmm. there were two people that made comments. A very prominent surgeon, who is an endoscopist, but a surgeon <coughs> from Boston, Mass General Hospital, and he said, I can do an open one in 20 minutes. Why do you need to do this? Yeah. The second person who stood up was Peter Cotton, renowned endoscopist, and I'll never forget his words. He said, I'm only sorry that I didn't think of this. That was Peter Cotton's words. Quite an endorsement, yeah. Quite an endorsement, yeah. and it took off after that. Yeah. Now, <coughs> I, I want to, I mean, it always fascinates me on how people get the idea to do something that's really, when you look at it in hindsight, like, oh yeah, that makes sense. <coughs> but, you know, there's a whole different process when you're doing it from scratch. You told me this story at one point where you guys were kind of um, intrigued by how well you could transilluminate. Is that, is that part of the well, story? Well, that's Especially really part kids. of the story, yeah. 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 We yeah. shut the room lights off. These babies were this, were this big, they were yeah. tiny, and the light shone through their belly, and you could push on the belly, Mike would push on the belly, and we see this big indentation. It's like we're only a couple of milliliters away from the each tube other. Right through that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now it seems obvious. Yeah. But in the baby, it was much more obvious than in the adult. Yeah, yeah. You know, ironically. Serendipity almost. Yeah. Huh? yeah. The baby's stomach is very small. It's, there's very little room to maneuver. A peg is harder in a baby than in an adult. You have this big room to do it in. Yeah. But the transillumination in the baby was very good. Yeah. So we were very fortunate serendipity worked out in that yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. Now, you were fashioning your own tubes, basically, Oh, at right? that time, it was fun. <laughs> I mean, we took a deep Pezar catheter, some mushroom tip catheter. We took a little Bunsen burner tubing, cut some side holes in it, and slid it down for the bolster behind. Uh -huh. We didn't, we, had, we wanted to make a dilator, and Mike got a, a, di, a, a IV uh, catheter called a MediCut, which doesn't have a hub. It's smoothly tapered. Mm -hmm. So we slipped that over the, the end of the tube to make a dilator. Ah. So what, originally we put a stitch through the end of the rubber tube and fed it through this dilating catheter. And we used to take a hemostat and try to stuff it into the dilator. One day I was walking down the hall with the rubber tube going like this. And I looked at it and said, wow, when you stretch rubber, it gets thinner. And so I put the stitch through the tube, ran it through the dilating catheter, and just put the tube on stretch and pop, it popped right on. Popped right in. So yeah. you make, you, you learn these things as you're doing it. Yeah. You know, yeah. in the beginning of the PEG procedure, we grabbed the silk as it came through the abdomen with a biopsy forceps. And sometimes that's a little bit of a stretch. You know, you keep missing it. Yeah. Then I realized if I put a snare around the puncturing needle and pass the catheter, the, the stitch through, I could just grab it with a snare. Yeah. So you learn these tricks. So instead of a wire, you were passing a suture through that needle. We used a needle. silk suture, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you were trying to grab with a biopsy forceps in the beginning. If I could forget that, let me get, use a snare. That's exactly. Yeah, I yeah. mean, we so learned tricks as we went along. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you took that basically from a procedure you're doing in the OR, to now it's become a bedside procedure we in a do. box, we basically. Do, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I remember listening to you at Grand Rounds um, at George Washington University where I did my residency. You came to give Grand Rounds while I was a, I think I was a chief resident there. And one of the comments you made, I'll never forget, you were uh, talking about uh, the peg, and you said that uh, you had made, um, that, that the peg had um, helped to make the early part of your academic career, and people would 
call, you, you spent five years telling people how to put these in, and you've spent the rest of your career telling them not to put so many in. Well, that's right. <laughs> how do you develop an academic career? You spend yeah. the first 20 years telling people to do something they think is not right. Yeah. Eventually, they jump on the bandwagon and say, this is the greatest, and you're the greatest. But what do you do for the second 20 years? You say, I was wrong, I was wrong, I was wrong. <laughs> uh, and we do good. overuse it sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and then, you know, looking through um, your publications, it, it seemed to me that, um, as in many things, then you started to advance. Like you said, all right, let's take it to adults. You did that over at Sinai. Uh, let's do it in the jejunum, right? So then you went to the pedge. Um, I, th I think you even put them in the cecum at some point. So when for, you yeah. have a, yeah. you know, you have a hammer, everything's <laughs> a nail. And so we wanted to figure out the concept was, the concept was of fixing a loop of bowel to the abdominal wall and mm. creating a tract that was permanent. That was the concept. Yeah. And then we started to say, and we're doing the same thing now with intramural surgery, which we can get to, but yeah. what else can I do with this concept? And so yes, we can put a tract in the stomach for feeding or decompression, but we can also throw a tube distally for jejunal feeding or puncture the jejunum, or we can try to puncture the cecum, which we did and published in 84, I think, for uh, uh, for uh, Ogilvy syndrome. And so we, we tried to use that anywhere we could. People other than me used it to pull down parasophageal hernias or to untwist a, 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 sequ um, a sigmoid valvulus. So the concept is to fix a loop of bowel in the abdomen and yeah. create a tract. So yeah. that's what we really did. I mean, the PEG was the first example of that. And uh, I would say that that innovation uh, sparked my career. It got me involved with uh, the ASGE and it made me visible to them. And uh, that was the beginning of a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, let's talk about that a little bit, your, your career, your academic uh, career. Actually, there's two things I want to cover. One is your progression in academia, because you've shared stories with me in the past about kind of your thoughts and going to a meeting and not wanting to just go to attend, like you want to be uh, present. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, but I also want to talk about your time at Sinai, because that's, I, I that's when I had the opportunity to do a fellowship with you, it was to start at Sinai. And I uh, had the impression that that was a special group and a special time for you, that around innovation and development and just fun. And uh, so I want to hear about both of those things. So let's start with the academia. Uh, bit a little bit if you don't mind and kind of walk me through how you've progressed in your academic career. Well it, it, it's it, when I was at Case Western I was raised as an academic surgeon and I was uh, joined the staff as an assistant professor and I was t taught that you had to publish and do research and I did laboratory research but I wasn't very good at it I always gravitated toward animal projects where I could measure the result of an intervention and usually in a whole animal, mm -hmm. which uh, became less and less popular as laboratories became more developed. Um, and I used to, I always tell this story too, that I would sit in my office at the end of the day, and you've heard this, and I would look around at my partners and they were, it's five o'clock, they're all reading their journals. They're all done. They're reading their journals. And I would say, I want to go home. <laughs> my family's at home. My kids are there. I want to eat dinner with them. So I would put all my paperwork and everything in a paper bag, and I'd sneak down the back stairs one flight and then take the elevator from there, get to my car and go home, and we'd have dinner, and then we'd put everything on the dining room table and have study hall with my kids. Did that every night. If I had to go back, I went back. Mm -hmm. That was mixing your personal life, which I think is more important, and your academic career. So yeah. we did that. Yeah. So, I, so everybody's doing their homework at night. Yeah, including and me. And kids get to see, hey, this homework thing seems to continue. Dad's got his own homework, too. But it was fun. <laughs> we had laughed. We yelled. We I yeah. scolded the kids. Your buddy Todd, my son, used to get sent to his room for screwing around too much. <laughs> A chip but off the old block, yeah, apparently. Yeah, but it was, it was good. Yeah, yeah. Anyhow, so I, then I got asked... It was really interesting. The chairman of the Department of Surgery was an interim chairman, a cardiac fellow. And he got called by Mount Sinai Hospital, which was across the street, and affiliated. And he, they had their own residency. It was separate. He said, these guys are driving me nuts. 
He said, it's a Jewish hospital, and, and, you know, and they can't get along over there, and these guys are all, every day, year they have a new chairman, and they can't make it work. He said, listen, do me a favor. Go over there and be the chairman. You're a good teacher, and the, you're a good clinician. Just go over there and be the chairman. I was three years in practice. I was 32. You're said, still an assistant professor? Yeah. I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> he said, please, do me a favor. If you don't like it, you can come back. The, board of the, the chairman of the board there took me out to dinner and this and that. I said, I said to my wife, I don't want to do this. Then the next board chairman came and saw me. He said, please come. Everybody was against it, and my wife said, give it a shot. So we went over there. My mother-in-law said, give it a shot. This, he, your mother-in-law, not yeah. the aunt that got you the No, scope. it was my mother-in-law okay. who got me the scope. Oh, okay. So her. the same mother -in -law. Same mother. This is an insightful mother-in-law. She was magnificent. <laughs> she was an angel. Anyhow... I went over there, and it was the best decision other than marrying my wife I've ever made. I, I had the opportunity to learn to build an academic department, and they gave me the resources to do it. We had a wonderful laboratory. I built a full-time staff of 11 people in general surgery, in cardiac surgery, in vascular surgery. They let me do it, and at the same time, they let me make mistakes. And we had a cohesive group there with a strong emphasis on laboratory work, with a strong emphasis on teaching. We had the number one clerkship in the Case Western Medical School for years. I won the number one prize in teaching, the Kaiser Permanente Teaching Award, while I was there from the students. They, so it was a wonderful environment. You experienced it for a while. Yeah. The people were interested in clinical medicine, but they liked to do research. And some of them published, not all. And they also let me get promoted. I had the same criteria for promotion as the guys at the university. But when I got up to a certain number of uh, publications, I was considered for both tenure and then uh, associate professor and professor. Mm -hmm. And I stayed there 18 years. At one point, after the development of minimally invasive surgery, we were way ahead of everybody in the city. They asked me to integrate my residency with the university residency. And we did. And it was a wonderful place. It got in the, into the war between two giants, the university and the Cleveland Clinic. It couldn't survive that, and it was sold. And I saw that was going to go under, and the clinic recruited me away. Yeah. But it was a, a passage in time of 100 years that that organization lived that was a marvelous hospital. Ironically, its endowment still goes on today to do good works. It's called the Mount Sinai Foundation in Cleveland. But that was a special time in my life. Yeah, yeah. It, it definitely had a feeling of a very coherent and special group that was there. And while I was there, I was involved with the ASGE, mm -hmm. and SAGES was born. Mm -hmm. And I was permitted the freedom to develop, to travel, and to do all the stuff I wanted to do. It, was, it shows people that you don't, it's not where you are. It's yeah. the people you work with and what your motivation is. Yeah. So let's talk about, I want to talk about the academic career and kind of that movement into some really, you know, major leadership positions in, in surgery and endoscopy. Um, you have to correct me on this, but I remember you telling me a story one time about, I think you were attending a meeting and not presenting. And you kind of made a personal vow that you weren't going to let that happen. Is that a correct uh, That's story? That's so right. <laughs> I, in my, I was crawling out of my skin. Uh -huh. I went to my first ASGE meeting in 1974 while I, I was still doing that fellowship okay. with Jim. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I had been doing so. We had come up with stuff that nobody else had done yet. Yeah. Like I had said, look at these polyps. And as a surgeon, I said, how am I going to find this area if it's cancer? And right. so I looked Surgically. up the literature yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. on Basil Morrison, and he had been painting the inside of the colon with India ink to see that nobody had injected India ink. So I bought the only thing I could afford then, which was an injection needle. Now they're disposable. I had this one needle. It's the same needle we use now. But it, it was reusable, NM1K it was called. And we injected India ink that I got from a bookstore and into the wall of the bowel. And I went to follow this patient to surgery, and we wrote it up, 1975. So tattooing. That was, that tattooing. was the beginning of tattooing. Yep. That was the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting at the meeting, and they're talking about this problem, and I wanted to go, ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I wasn't presenting at that first meeting. That didn't happen again. Yeah. After that, 1975, we presented that paper, and Jerry Way was the moderator. So I got to know Jerry Way. Mm-hmm. 
And he looked at me and said, wow, you're doing some interesting stuff. So that was interesting. That was yeah. before Peg. Yeah. yeah. Okay? Yeah. And uh, we got to know each other because of tattooing. And in the early days, uh, and that meeting was in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. never forget these meetings, but I was not going to sit in the meeting and not present because you wanted to be a part of the team. Yeah, yeah. It yeah, made the meeting yeah. so much more part fun. Part of the club, yeah. yeah. That's good. That's neat. So, um, so you started early really getting on at a podium for some of these uh, meetings. Um, I do want to walk through that a little bit, but um, uh, I have to talk a little bit at least about the laparoscopy and stages, make a little diversion that okay. way. Because um, you, you were ascending in two major organizations, ASGE and in SAGES. And, and SAGES was an interesting group of surgeons that wanted to do endoscopy like you did, but then this laparoscopy, this lap coli thing comes along. So and you had, were in a pretty interesting position. Oh, I was in a great time. position. Yeah. What happened with SAGES? I was already on the, on the major committees of ASGE mm -hmm. in the early 80s. And they wanted to include the surgeons and Mel Shapiro and Jerry Way and some of these guys got me on the committees and I was and then all of a sudden, I got a call from this group of surgeons, early 80s, 1981 or so. They wanted me to be involved in this new group of surgeons who were unhappy with ASGE and wanted to do their own thing. At first, I wasn't so sure about this. So I went to them and I said, okay, I'm going to be a part of this too. And we started to have meetings in the mid-80s. And I suddenly, a light went off over my head. They weren't talking about the same things at all. They were talking about different stuff. How you use endoscopy to influence a bowel obstruction, how you decompress a dilated colon, how you evaluate an anastomosis. It was all different stuff. Hmm. I said, wait a minute, surgeons aren't talking about the same thing as the gastroenterologist. And so I was involved in SAGES, and I got to be the president of SAGES in about 1990. I was actually president for two years because they changed You're it. You're the only person who's been president <laughs> for two years. Anyhow, yeah. they changed it. Yeah. So I was there. Maybe they don't do that anymore because of me. Because of me, <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, the here I am, and all of a sudden, 1989, Jacques Parasat shows this video in, at the Sages meeting in, in Louisville, Kentucky, of a lap coli. It's in the exhibit hall. And we all went crazy. So next year, I train in lap. I train because I'm the president. You can't get into these courses. I'm the president. <laughs> I got right in. And George Bercy and John Hunter and Nat Soper were my teachers. We learned to do lap coli. Mm. But I was on the wave because at that point, Sages had 300 members when I was first president. By the time I was done, there was 2,000 members. Yeah. And lap coli and laparoscopic <clears throat> surgery did that. Amazing. So Amazing. I was lucky to be in the right place at the right yeah, time. Yeah, really innovative time. And really, in parallel, you're rising in ASGE as well. In fact, when I was your fellow, you were president of ASGE. So ASGE is a meritocracy. What it meant was it, there are some very prestigious organizations where they call you up, you sit in the audience, and they say, and now we nominate Jeff Ponsky to be vice president. You, you, I, I didn't do anything for this organization, yeah. but you, you're recognized and you, they respect you and you're the president. That's how they do it. Yeah. That's fair, yeah. but not the ASGE. The ASGE, you earn your way up. I was on the membership committee, then I was the chair of the membership committee, then I was on the uh, governing board, then I was a treasurer of ASGE. You work your way up. Yeah. 20 yeah. years on the board of ASGE. Yeah. And finally... I got to be the president of ASG, and there weren't many surgeons who were president of ASG. How, how many up to that point had Two. been surgeons? Me and Ted Schrock. Okay. Mm -hmm. and so you're the second surgeon to be president I, of ASG. Yeah, I believe mm -hmm. so. That's yeah. right. And then the highlight of my career probably was that number of 2002, I was given their highest award, the Schindler the Award. Schindler Award, that's which right. Which I just sort of went, oh, my God. That is the most prestigious award I have on my, on my wall because... It meant that I was recognized as an endoscopist who'd made a contribution by the people who most do endoscopy. Mm -hmm. It was mostly gastroenterologists. So that was a very warm award for me, very good. I also got the Bercy Award from Sages, which is a parallel award in the surgical yeah. endoscopy field. So yeah. those were the two highlights of, of, in awards. That's amazing. That's amazing. So I, yeah, I, don't, I, I don't think... Um, 
a lot of members of ASG might, uh, might have remembered that history uh, of surgeons being involved really at that level of, of leadership. And I think it's a perfect example of, um, you know, the opportunities for uh, cross-specialty collaboration really around yeah. endoscopy. There is a tendency for people to be protective of their specialty. It's because of economics in most cases. When surgeons and gastroenterologists work shoulder to shoulder, there are tremendous opportunities for advancements. And in the terms of the governing board of ASGE, when we worked together, we had great fellowship and great opportunity. I think from time to time you find that people forget that. There's a tendency to keep bringing on the same people who you trained with or you know. And you almost have to become uncomfortable enough to invite other people into the party a little bit to make it better. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think an example um, of really excellent collaboration was around the early notes days and the whole NOSCAR formation. Um, another wave that you were a big part of, uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Like the first time you were introduced to notes, some of your thoughts about it. And I know you and your lab and the people in your lab really did some so work to try to advance the understanding of that concept. Yeah. Yeah. So the way notes actually started is that there was a wonderful laparoscopic surgeon who was doing a lap coli with needle scopic instruments, which were two millimeters, even mm -hmm. a telescope. And so he very carefully used a needle to dissect out the gallbladder and he hand tied the, the suture duct, yeah. around the cystic duct and the cystic artery and cut it with a little tiny scissors, two millimeter instrument. But how was he to get the gallbladder out? He made an incision in the stomach, dropped the gallbladder in, sewed up the stomach and reached in with an endoscope and took it out. That was never published. It was really not something that anybody wanted to publicize, but people heard about it. And then Tony Kalu, you know, and Sergei Kansavoy in 2004 at uh, Johns Hopkins lab published cases in animals using the eagle claw with the Apollo group. They developed it and they did this uh, gastroenterostomy, which got people so excited. Yeah. And then uh, we had the people in India, uh, Reddy and Rao, who are wonderful, magnificent people, did the first lap, I mean, the first transgastric appendectomy, a notes appendectomy, and they showed the video. They let me use it in the United States. They made only one mistake. They never published it. Yeah. it t I tell the residents, if you're going to do something that well, publish it. Anyhow, we ended up, I was at University Hospital at that point. I started my 10 years as chairman there. And we had a beautiful laboratory that I was fortunate enough to put together. And the gastro, I brought the gastroenterologist down, wonderful GI group at University Hospital. I love them. Amitab Chuck, Ashley Foe, Gerard Eisenberg. And uh, we all came down together. We worked shoulder to shoulder and we did notes research, Jeff Marks. And we published so many papers on notes. We did everything to a pig you could possibly <laughs> do. And we did it in people under an IRB protocol. And the way we ended up with that is the people doing notes together in the United States got together and formed a group of people. At dinner, Nat Soper, having a couple of glasses of wine, came up with the acronym NOSCAR, yeah. a Natural Orifice Surgery Consortium for, sur for Assessment, for assessment and Research. And, research. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and uh, we, we, we understood that this would only be done under IRB with good informed consent. Yeah. And we did it. We've actually published what I think was the first notes procedure in a human in the United States, which was peg, peg rescue. rescue. <laughs> where we actually, when a peg got pulled out acutely, we went through the tract into the peritoneal cavity, passed a string into the peritoneal cavity through the hole, pulled it back into the stomach and out the mouth and pull the new tube in. Peg in. Yeah. So we still yeah. use that today. Yeah. So, I mean, Notes was a wonderful example of collaboration by surgeons. And we made great friends yeah. uh, throughout the country yeah. uh, doing so, that. And that was, so NOSCAR was, uh, is, it still exists, a consortium between ASG and SAGES to really responsibly move the field of Notes forward. With Very the vision that if you didn't do it responsibly, if people were just kind of being willy-nilly about it, that it would potentially doom the specialty if you had bad results. It also set the bar for new procedures yeah. that were experimental. So when POEM was first introduced, mm -hmm. we did it under IRB. 
We yeah. did all of our new procedures under IRB until we'd done a, a significant number and looked at the results and we knew what we were doing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good way to advance and to have others look at the work you're doing and give you feedback about Absolutely. whether it's the right thing or not. Um, so let, I'm going to go back to some of the mechanics a little bit because we've been, we've been talking about some of the advances, some of your leadership. Actually, before I leave leadership, I need to talk about one other organization because we talked about ASGE for sure, not only leading that organization, but being awarded a really special award from the organization. Talked about SAGES. You've been involved with the American Board of Surgery. I have. That's <laughs> amazing. So, so talk a little bit about that. So like here we are as SAGES suddenly becomes recognized as a real organization with impact and the American Board of Surgery said we would like them to have representation on the American Board of Surgery. Would they submit three names is the way they do it, and we'll pick one. And I don't know why, but they picked me. Mm -hmm. So I got to be a director of the American Board of Surgery, which was far beyond my wildest dreams. I loved it, great honor. And then one day, they called me up and they said, you've been selected to be the, ch the uh, chairman of the American Board of Surgery. You have to be on another year. I went, are you kidding? So I did that, which was a, a great, great, great honor in American surgery for me. So uh, I've been as lucky as anything else and uh, been blessed to be around good people. Yeah, amazing experience. And I, I, I don't know if, this, if you would agree with this, but I do credit that leadership role in the board as being one of the factors that's really pushed the board to um, uh, more formalize their training in flexible endoscopy for surgery training. So in the across beginning, the country. they were just working on numbers, right? And the numbers were weak. Yeah, just numbers were weak. There had to be more. And thanks to the efforts of you, mm -hmm. Jeff Marks, and Sages, there are courses now. There are uh, the objective measures of advancement and success, and every resident who finishes surgery today has to have the training in flexible endoscopic surgery. Yeah. And so FES exists. Yeah. And uh, listen, it, it was nice. The American Board of Surgery was willing to use uh, the information we gave them. Yeah. Well, I'm crediting you, at least in part, to putting the bug in the ear of the organization to do that. So let's go. So you were at Sinai. We talked about um, Mount Sinai. The hospital actually doesn't exist anymore. No. Um, and you were recruited to come over to the Cleveland Clinic. In fact, my second half of my fellowship, I went with you. You showed uh, me around. I didn't know where I was going. <laughs> we used to, yeah, I used to find the different pathways, and then, and then we'd go there together. Um, talk about that a little bit, the difference between Sinai and the clinic. Um, I remember you coming in with, um, in my opinion at the time, as a trainee under you, a very humble um, attitude about joining this organization and then I've seen you, you know, rise through that organization. So let's talk about that case and then Cleveland again I a think any time you go to a new place, it's a good idea to realize that you're new and you have to learn about them. The Cleveland Clinic is a long-standing and magnificent organization. And although it may look like they do exactly the same thing as you do at other hospitals, they do other things. They have some of the uh, most high acuity patients I've ever seen. They really do. And so you're into a different realm. Also, because there's so many people with excellent skills, you become a little bit pigeonholed. So my old career of doing colon surgery, breast surgery, endoscopy, and all sorts of other things became more aligned with endoscopy and foregut. And that's what you were with me there doing. We did a lot of parasophageal hernias and nissens, as well as doing tremendous numbers of ERCP and endoscopy. And it was a very productive time for me. Yeah. And uh, they had great resources, and uh, it, it wasn't the same warm, fuzzy place that the little hospital was, but it was a place where I further matured, I mm -hmm. think. And how long were you there? Cause I was there for eight years uh -huh. the first time, yeah. Yeah, and then you were recruited home. I was recruited to Case <laughs> Western to University Hospital. Yeah. And to be, to in be Cleveland, the chair of surgery. To be there. the chairman of the Department of Surgery at mm -hmm. the university and the hospital. And it was a great opportunity there because we built a great department there. We modeled it a little bit after both places. I modeled it after, I wanted the clinical excellence and renown that we had at the clinic. Mm -hmm. And I wanted the warm, fuzzy, personal feeling that I had at Sinai. And we were able to do that because of its size and scope. Yeah. It was yeah. a very good department. 
And um, lessons learned from uh, your time at Sinai versus uh, going back to be chair at Case. A little different level and well, different a type whole, of institution. Well, the world is a different place. Yeah. At different Sinai, era, yeah. I didn't even know what the budget was. Yeah. We never even talked about RVUs. There was no such thing. You just worked and worked and went home. Of necessity, the world is different. We talk now about budgets, mm. clinical productivity. At the end of my time at Sinai, it was starting to happen. And I would ask for, let me a KTP laser, get me a homium laser. And they would say, do you know what the return on investment is? I said, I don't know what the heck you're talking about. So they sent me to get, they paid for me to get an MBA. I was the stupidest kid in the class. <laughs> but I learned the lingo and I understood how investment decisions were made mm -hmm. and how you had to justify them. So I would tell anybody now going into a leadership position that you can't just wing it. You have to understand what the other fella is going through, what the people in leadership have to do to make the budget work. You have to understand that as much as you like the next guy, he has to justify his salary and, and make it at the same time. That shouldn't be done coldly. You should look at the people who work for you and understand, and I used to say this, when you drive down the hill to the, clinic, to the university hospital every day, I know you're not thinking about how to make this place better. I know you're thinking about how to get enough money to send your kid to private school and how to pay for camp. And you had an argument with your wife today and how you can fix that. Everyone's got those personal problems. And I used to meet with them in their annual professional review and say, how can I help you to make your personal life better? So we used to have faculty enrichment seminars. And we used to do things that made life a little bit more personal and better. I mm -hmm. think you have to do that in any business that succeeds. Yeah, yeah. Balance the realities of um, the, the economics, and uh, but but don't lose um, don't lose the people. Don't lose the. Well, issue. at yeah. the end of the day, and you know, you become philosophical as yeah. you become older. Uh -huh. Not that I'm older, but I'm older. <laughs> and you look back at your life and say, what has been the greatest things in my life? And it's not your career. If it's your career, I feel sorry for you. Because your personal life is really a bigger part of the pie. And if you stood back, and they always say this, if you could paint the picture of your life ahead of time, how much of it would you want to be the career? And how much would you want it to be the rest of your life? Mm -hmm. And I personally feel that my family and what I've got with that far exceeds what I've done in my professional life. They complement each other. Yeah. Yeah, and I've got to spend some time with your family and, and your kids, and um, it's a special group. I've, I've learned from you about, uh, uh, about some of the parenting things. In fact, sp speaking of family, I have to hear, I don't know if I know this story about how you met your wife and, uh, and, and uh, how you got together with Jackie. Well, so Jackie lived around the block from me, but I never knew her until I graduated from college. Okay, and so another so, uh, Cleveland person born and raised. Right, and born and raised, but around the block. Mm -hmm. And uh, she went to the, the more affluent school than I did. She went to Shaker, I went to Cleveland Heights High School. And so one day, <clears throat> I had a mutual friend with her and she was over there and I went over the house. I went over because I heard she was there, I wanted to see who she was and she was sort of cute. And I said, would you like to go out on a date? And she said, I'll let you know. And so she asked our mutual friend, she said, should I go out with him? She said, well, he's not the kind of guy you'd want to marry, but he's a lot of fun. And to this day, <laughs> Jackie will say it's the opposite. I'm no fun, but I was a good husband. Um, but the, when we finally wanted to get married, she, her father, I told her father, I want to I wanna marry this girl. Can I want to marry your daughter? He said, well, you're going to get her a ring. And I said, I, I don't have any money. I'm working at Mount Sinai in the summer. He said, well, what are you going to put away this summer? I said, well, my uncle gave me $100. I'll have $600 by the end of the summer. He said, go with my wife to this jewelry store and pick out a ring. You've got to put a ring on her finger. So I went with her, her mother, Jackie's mother, again. This mother-in-law is coming through she from was the beginning. From the beginning. <laughs> so we go to the jewelry store, and we're looking around, and he says, I have some estate jewelry. Says, Here's a stone. It's an emerald. It's a small one. It's a nice one. And I'll put two little diamonds on a simple band, and I'll give it to you for $600, for your $600. Okay. And that was it. That ring I gave to Jackie. Ten years later, 
I'm a little more sophisticated. I'm now the chairman of surgery at Mount Sinai. And her father was already dead. And I looked at that ring, which is a one carat emerald. I went, oh no, something was really wrong. I called up her mother. I said, this is nonsense. This ring didn't cost $600. She started laughing. She said, no matter what you picked out, it would have been $600. <laughs> that was the price that day. <laughs> that was the price that day. Amazing, amazing. So, uh, all right, back a little bit to the, to the timeline, because you were, how long were you the chair of surgery at Case? Ten, almost nine and a half years. Nine, almost 10 years. Yeah. And then you're back, now you're back at the Cleveland Clinic again. Yeah, what happened at Case was that I was 67 and my contract would have been up the next year. And they weren't going to hire somebody to be the chairman again to go over 70. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Cosgrove called me up from the clinic at about that time. He said, why don't you come back to the clinic? You can do everything you want here. He didn't just want me. He wanted all the people I could probably bring back with me. Mm -hmm. I'm being humble, but I'm being honest. And so I came back to the clinic a year before my contract was up because I could work as long as I wanted the clinic, doing the volume of what I want. The clinic has tremendous volume of endoscopy. Yeah. This year I did almost 1,200 endoscopies. Really? And yeah. so I can do it, and I'm 72, and I can still do the work I want to do. Yeah. And, and, and tell us about it. Like, what's your day-to-day -day now? Because I know you day go I between go Florida and the clinic, so talk about that a little bit. Well, I told them, put me wherever you need me, because they have a large volume, but they have a lot of satellites. Mm -hmm. And so day-to-day, uh, -day, I'll go to the outpatient unit at the main hospital and do a bunch of cases, or I'll go to the advanced unit and do a bunch of cases, advanced cases, or I'll be in the operating room doing poems and pops and stuff like that. And then I go to the suburbs once a week or twice a week as well because they have a big backlog, and I'll do simple uppers and lowers there. Yeah. But when once a month I go down to Florida, mm -hmm. and I'll fly in, I'll get there at 9.30 in the morning, Go down to the clinic, get the Cleveland Clinic, Florida. The Cleveland mm -hmm. Clinic, Florida, and yeah. Weston, and I'll start to work with GI down there, and we'll do end advanced endoscopy on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I'm off, and Monday I work all day. Tuesday I work all day, and I take a nighttime flight back to Cleveland Tuesday night and work at the clinic on Wednesday. <laughs> so I get a weekend a month in Florida. Yeah. So you really, your practice right now is exclusively therapeutic endoscopy. Exclusively yeah. endoscopy. Yeah. And that's my dream. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah. I stopped amazing. doing surgery two years ago when I was 70. Uh -huh. It's uh -huh. something, it's a loss. Yeah. But uh, I've done it for 40 years and that was enough. Yeah. And you certainly aren't slowing down at, at No, uh, I'm, I'm keeping cases. going. My uh, wife doesn't want me at home because my hobbies cost too much money. <laughs> Well, I think one of the other things that I admire about you and your career is that um, it's never stagnant. So um, let's talk a little bit about where endoscopy is going, because you've been part of that as well, this, this um, intramural surgery, starting with peroral endoscopic myotomy and, and then others. St tell me about your experience, how you got into that, and, and where do you see this going? Well, I, you have to give credit where credit is due. Jay Pasrika in the United States and Silvana Peretta and the people at IRCAD in France uh, conceived in the era of notes of making a tunnel in the wall of the esophagus to get into the peritoneal cavity so that when you came out there wouldn't there be a flap valve and it wouldn't leak. leak yeah. And on the way they said, gee, the muscle's there. Why, what if we could cut this for achalasia? But they never did it. Why? because it took a surgeon, and the people in France were surgeons, but it was done in a human first by Haru Inoue in Yokohama in about 2004, I think. Uh, yeah, it might have been a little bit later. I think 2007. Well, he published in, yeah, so you might be right. Might, no, have 2007 been or yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, Haru did it, and then the first people I knew in the United States doing it were the people at Northwestern, uh, Nat Soper and Eric Hungness. Mm -hmm. And right away, Eric, I called him, and Jeff Marks called him, and we had him come, and he taught us in the lab. And then we did two cases in humans, and we, with him proctoring us, and that was it. And that was probably seven years ago. And we've been doing it since. And what that showed us we've, is that the response of the patients was remarkable. In what way? T tell me a little you bit about You would do this. this case. You'd sweat your brains out because you were so nervous in the beginning, yeah. now we argue about which music to play, but <laughs> we were nervous as could be, and then the patients would come back, 
You say, you changed my life. I feel so great. You go right back and do it again. Yeah. And then we started looking around at other sphincters. What else are the problems? So this concept of intramural surgery, people, at least Wanstrom, a big leader in this area, and the people were doing the pylorus, and they were doing along, and they still are along the greater curvature and up. I said, look, let's do it the short way. Let's just go two centi five centimeters down the lesser curve right to the pylorus and cut it. And it's worked out. We've done over 300 cases at the clinic. So now you're doing pyloromyotomy, same That's what I'm saying. tunneling it's technique. Tunneling yep. technique, we call it a POP, peroral pyloromyotomy. Yeah. Some people call it a G-POM, but peroral pyloromyotomy describes it. Yeah. And you know, you wouldn't think it worked until we studied the patients and two thirds, three quarters of them have improved or normalized gastric emptying and they're better. Yeah. So, and it doesn't cause any real harm. It's an outpatient procedure essentially. So that's one. And then we went back up and we said, well, we're looking in that same tunnel. We can take out stromal tumors or more likely lyomyomas of the esophagus and stomach now making this tunnel. So all of a sudden we have a way to work in the wall, which I call intramural surgery. Other people call it third space endoscopy, whatever you want. Yeah. I like to call it intramural surgery because we're doing something. Went back and looked at other places. And so the Zenker's diverticulum was always a great place to work, but we never even paid attention to it. And for years we just cut it and prayed that it wouldn't leak if we went too far. Uh, the ENT people had done it, but they, they do it at a distance. Yeah. Um, and all of a sudden, we have this intramural approach, so now we open the mucosa, we tunnel under it a little bit, we cut the mucosa off, of, we push it off of the muscle, cut the muscle as much as we want, yeah. and just clip the mucosa home and send them home. It's a, a double-sided tunnel, one on each side of the muscle, and then you just yeah, cut it's it very, and very close quick. the mucosa up. Close Same the mucosa, right, idea. you just close it on both, you clean yeah. it on both sides, cut yeah. it, and yeah. clip it close and go home. Yeah. And yeah. it works Patients call me up to say, do I really have to come in for a visit? We do the visit over the phone because they're happy. Yeah. So this is an era where we're learning this is just the beginning. That's, As a surgeon. That's four operations you've just replaced with endoscopy. Exactly. <laughs> and it's just the beginning because mm -hmm. as a surgeon, I fought against the robot. I thought it was a toy. People were doing things with it I didn't agree with. And now I'm going to tell you that with the maturation of this new technology, we will use it. The way we do ESD today, yeah. is pr it's like pushing a nickel across the room with your nose. <laughs> I mean, we are going to lift it and cut it, just like we do in surgery. Mm -hmm. We are going to tie knots, we are gonna do full thickness resection, and we're gonna sit at a console, just like, because we'll park the endoscope and use surgery, it's a surgical technique. Does this steal anything from anybody? No. If the gastroenterologists and surgeons learn to do this, it doesn't matter who's doing it as long as they're good at it. Yeah, yeah. And so we need to work together to go faster and yeah. not worry about keeping each other out of the unit. Yeah. We need each other's brains because our paradigms are different. The way we think, and I'll give you another example. If you're doing, I was doing a gastrostomy the other day. And the patient had a very tight uh, radiation stricture of the esophagus. I could only get a tiny scope down into the stomach. And we could see where to make the peg. We could get a needle in. Yeah. But I couldn't possibly drag a tube through there. And we know that there's the introducer technique with the peel-away sheath, but it gives you a tiny Foley catheter. So we used another technique that we described the years before, but I used it the other day. And it was so great. We put in T-fasteners in the abdomen. And we used a surgical trocar made by Covidian, the step trocar that you put, you put a needle in and then you dilate it as big as my finger. Radially expands. Radially yep. expands like a mm -hmm. stent. Yeah. And now I just put in an AMT that's a, 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 a tube with a, a, a tip on the end that you pull the string in and it expands and took out the trocar over it. Yeah. Now we had a regular peg in the stomach with T fasteners, surgical thinking because we knew about trocars. Yeah. If we combine our thought processes, we can do so much more. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, one thing you taught me when I was first getting into practice and as a young surgeon wanting to do endoscopy was uh, just keep your head down, do good work, and uh, things will work out. And I, I will have, I'll have to say that following that advice, I've had so much fun working with gastroenterologists in units together 
just like that. Let, let's figure out how do we take care of this problem. Yeah. And yeah. I'm, believe me, I'm calling him into my room all the time because I don't understand what I'm looking at sometimes. Yeah. If you're doing enough endoscopy, you're going to come across lesions that you don't understand. Yeah. yeah. And I see this desquamative esophagitis and I go, oh my God, what am I going to do about this? And they come in and they look with me and they say, well, there's nothing much to do here, but this is what it is. Yeah. Or they're working, they, they, we see a feline esophagus and this is EOE. Yeah. I said, who cares about EOE? What do you want me to do with this patient? And then we talk about it. Yeah. So EOE isn't a big interest of mine. I can recognize it and then biopsy it. And then I want the gastroenterologist to work with me on the care of the patient. Yeah. So we, we, we work with each other. Yeah. So with, with that world in mind, we talked about intramural surgery. We've, we've seen multiple examples now of endoscopy really replacing traditional surgical operations. What do you give advice to um, uh, uh, either medical track clinicians or surgical track clinicians that want to use endoscopy in their practice about, about their training and, and, and what they should be thinking about for the field? Well, I, for the surgeons in particular, I tell them if you're really interested in making endoscopy a, a big part of your career, do a fellowship in endoscopy and get advanced training. Mm -hmm. I mean, surgeons use endoscopy every day. If you're a foregut surgeon, you put that scope down, you look at your anastomosis, you leak test it, you look at your, your results of your bariatric case, you want to know if the anastomosis is too big, if there's a fistula, you need to look at your stuff. Colon, G, uh, uh, colon surgeons need to use endoscopy every day for whatever they do. But if you want to do advanced procedures like intramural surgery, if you want to do ESD, take a fellowship and get well trained, nobody will be able to knock your credentials. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So what's next for you? You're, you're busy clinically. You're flying back and forth between two states doing procedures. Uh, concentrating on therapeutic endoscopy. We had these discussions when I was a fellow. You said, you always said, yeah, my ideal uh, uh, semi-retirement was I'm just going to do ERCP all day long. Yeah. <laughs> I don't do as much as the ERCP because I want to let the younger guys do it mm -hmm. because their career depends on it. Yeah. Mind, I do the ones they don't want to do. Transgastric ERCP, 600-pound patients on their backs in the OR. I do a lot of those. But yeah. And I also do the babies. I do the ERCP and the babies that get sent in. But what do I want to do with the rest of my career? I, I think at some point you have to understand that there might be a horizon at the end of your career. Right now I can do endoscopy well and incredibly, and I'm still innovating. And I evaluate it every day. And when I feel that it's not fun anymore or I'm not doing as well anymore or that I'm not being competitive with everybody else, then I'm going to step aside. Yeah. And I can still teach things. So. Yeah, yeah. And I think w one of the things that I've enjoyed about uh, academic medicine, and you have in a factor well beyond, is you've created an international um, group around you. You have friends all over the world um, as, a, uh, as a result of the work that you've collaborated on over the years. And that just has to be so satisfying. Well, to it's so to, much fun. Uh, yeah. Because you get calls from people Somebody is in, in Italy and they don't know who to go to. They're having a problem. And you say, oh, here, go see my friend over there, you know. Yeah. Uh, or, or in England or India or wherever they are. And uh, somebody called me the other day. They were in India and they had a prize. So, well, why don't you get yourself to Hyderabad? Because I got two buddies over there who are nobody better in the world. Yeah. And at the same time, sometimes a surgeon will call me and say, I want to get trained in the RCP. I'm committed. I'll do anything. I said, we'll see how committed you are. If you go to Hyderabad and you work at the Asian Institute with those guys, they have a high volume. You should spend several months, at least several months doing it. Or go to Chile with, uh, with uh, Navarrete, yeah. you know, and uh, let Claudio Navarrete teach you over there because there's a huge volume. But make a commitment. I tell people you have to make a commitment. You don't spend two weeks with me and think you're going to do something. Yeah, yeah. Last thoughts before we bring things to a close here. Anything you want to share with the audience? Your thoughts uh, from your perspective? Well, your life takes you on a journey that you don't always expect. That opportunities come by and they look like they're not important. And suddenly they can slingshot you to your whole career, your whole life. And that's all fun and good. But when you evaluate your days, you should plan on how you want your life and that portrait to look. That's really what's important. Yeah. 
Well said. Well, that brings this edition of uh, Video Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, the Master's Series, to a close. I hope you've enjoyed it nearly as much as I have. Thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed the stories and the perspective. And um, have a good day.